The governor insists that he heard a shot before he was struck and that therefore he could not have been struck by the first bullet, as the Warren Commission supposes. Those of you who were with us last night will remember that we cited indications in the Zabruder film that it was Oswald's first shot, fired earlier than the commission believed, which missed. Now, if that is so, then the governor could indeed have heard a shot and begun reacting to it before he himself was hit. We have, in fact, three theories to explain the same facts. The single bullet theory, the second assassin theory, the theory that all three bullets that were fired found their targets. Our own view on the evidence is that it is difficult to believe the single bullet theory, but to believe the other theories is even more difficult. If the governor's wounds were caused by a separate bullet, then we must believe that a bullet passed through the president's neck, emerged at high velocity on a course that was taking it directly into the middle of the automobile, and then vanished without a trace. Or we can complicate matters even further, as some do, by adding a second assassin who fires almost simultaneously with Oswald and whose bullet travels miraculously, a trajectory identical with Oswald's, and that second assassin, too, vanishes without a trace. Difficult to believe, as the single bullet theory may be, it seems to be the least difficult of all those that are available. In the end, like the commission, we are persuaded that a single bullet wounded both President Kennedy and Governor Connolly. The Warren Report's contention that there was only one assassin rests on the conviction that all the wounds suffered by both men were inflicted by no more than three shots fired from behind and above them. We have heard Captain Humes, as well as other doctors and experts, we have looked hard at the single bullet theory. The case is a strong one. There is not a single item of hard evidence for a second assassin, no wound that can be attributed to him, no one who saw him although he would have been firing in full view of a crowded plaza. No bullets, no cartridge cases, nothing tangible. If the demands for certainty that are made upon the commission were applied to its critics, the theory of a second assassin would vanish before it was spoken. As for the governor, he now concedes he might have been struck by the bullet that pierced the president's throat, and our own investigation makes it likely that the bullet was the second and not the first that Oswald fired. The governor's objections, which were the most troubling of all, now disappear. CBS News concludes, therefore, that Oswald was the sole assassin. But was he truly alone, or were there others in dark shadows behind him, co-authors of a plot in which Oswald was cast as a trigger man? Tomorrow, we will look into those charges and concern ourselves with Officer Tippett, with Jack Ruby, and uh, the murky accounts and strange personages introduced into the case by District Attorney Jim Garrison in New Orleans. He did not uh, touch a gun on that day. He was a decoy at first, and, and then he was a patsy, and then he was a victim. We will hear Garrison and some of those whom he has involved, and we will try to answer the third of our major questions. Was Lee Harvey Oswald part of a conspiracy? This is Walter Cronkite. Good night. This has been the second of a series, a CBS News Inquiry, The Warren Report. The third part will appear tomorrow night at this same time. This broadcast has been produced under the supervision and control of CBS News.